My name is Till and this is Till Talk. All interviews are about the spiritual path, self-discovery, meditation and consciousness. Today, my guest will be Alex Barron. He's also a YouTuber and a friend of mine. We talk about his spiritual journey, which steered him from philosophy over psychedelics to Zen Buddhism. You know, if you try to get hit by lightning, which in the case of meditation is just a peace and a calmness, you still need to go on the mountain, you still need to put your hand up in the air, but then it's no longer up to you. Let's talk till tomorrow. That sounds actually pretty chilled. Um, I would say before we dive um, right into the actual interview, um, just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, just very quickly, who you are, what you're doing, and yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm a male, <laughs> I'm 24 years old. <laughs> I am from Germany, Tübingen to be exact. And... Yeah, currently I'm working on becoming a meditation teacher, uh, like to run my own classes, uh, which I'm doing currently for the first time in my life, the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, then I also just started to study psychology and I also have a YouTube channel. So these are, I guess, my main, yeah, uh, objectives or projects that I'm working on right now and they are all very uh, long-term based uh, yeah yeah I mean I'm also part of one of his meditation groups so so far it's going quite well I would say okay nice so you said um, you start studying psychology um, you have a YouTube channel you um, do meditation groups what exactly are you talking about on your YouTube channel? Uh, for me, it's always actually a little bit hard to define because as soon as you say, I talk about this, I talk about that, that also kind of means you don't talk about this and you don't talk about that. And there are like a lot of things I'm like passionate about. So I, I guess I want to try to talk about a lot of different things, but on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to talk about too many different topics. So I try to focus on personal development and spiritual development. Uh, I think that's the best way to uh, yeah, describe what I talk about. Um, yeah, and I also have a podcast which is called Waking Up, Growing Up, which also captures this uh, or these two different paths of development. And yeah. In actuality, that means the spiritual development part is mostly about spiritual practices, uh, especially about meditation. And the personal development part is, yeah, I guess about general things that you can do to improve your lives, changing your habits, doing this, doing that. And also, uh, yeah, I guess meditation is also one habit that you can introduce into your life. So both of these lines of development they're also closely connected but yeah the, the one thing focuses more on just improving your life in general like i don't know becoming a better husband becoming a better son becoming a better partner being a better student you know like everything you can do to be a better version of yourself but then the spiritual part it's more about yeah coming to certain realizations about the yeah, nature i guess of yourself or of life of existence in general which is uh, yeah not so much confined in our personality but something that goes yeah beyond ourselves okay interesting um you said that i mean you would discuss those two separate things but that they are actually also very related what do you think in what kind of way are the personal development and the spiritual development related it's always not so easy to pinpoint but i think the best explanation that you could give is that if you have spiritual practices that allows you to progress at a faster rate or a little bit 
easier in your personal development because then you may have more peace of mind, more tranquility. Uh, yeah, and then you're maybe not so stuck in certain ways of your personality, which then can hinder you in your development. So, yeah, it just takes the steam off of your personality and of what you do and just gives you a little bit more freedom to operate. And yeah, I always like this analogy of meditation being this practice, which allows you basically to view, I think it's called labyrinth uh, from a bird's eye view. So if your personal development is being like in the labyrinth, then meditation allows you to see everything from above and really lets you understand a lot about yourself, about your personality. So in that way, it can allow you to do certain things or to change certain things about yourself, which otherwise you may not have found that easily or, yeah, not have seen coming. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and you mentioned that you also do spiritual practices, especially meditation, um, just for the people that uh, are not so, or let's say, do not know so much about meditation. What is it actually that you are doing in your daily life? What kind of uh, meditation or spiritual practice? I practice what is called Zazen, which is basically just a style of meditation that comes from Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism is just a certain school or certain branch from Buddhism in general. And yeah, that style of meditation or that art of meditation is just, yeah, It's not so much about a certain technique. It's not so much about watching your breath or scanning your body or trying to channel some kind of energy or chanting a mantra or whatever. It's really just about sitting or you can also practice this while walking. But it's very simple, very clear. And in the end, it's just about... <clears throat> letting your awareness and letting everything just do what it does like you don't try to focus your awareness on something you don't try to reach anything basically you're just sitting you're just walking and by yeah doing something so so honestly let's say or so genuinely yeah uh You basically just allow life to take over and do everything for you. A little bit like uh, this analogy of having a cup of water with a lot of dirt in it. Like you just let it sit and then the dirt, like it just sinks by itself and everything organizes it itself by itself. So, yeah, you just allow everything to happen and you just take yourself out of the equation. You no longer try to do anything actively besides just sitting or just walking. And yeah, you just recognize whenever you're too deep into thought or whatever you're doing or you're too stuck in your feelings, you're just, oh, I'm stuck in my feelings. And then that's it. And then you're already free from your feelings or your thoughts or whatever. How does it actually feel if... Let's say, you know, like you're doing your personal development, you go to the gym, maybe you study, do something else. And it's like about like kind of um, becoming a better version more or something. But when you just sit down and do nothing, which is actually, I don't know if you can say it, kind of the opposite. How does that feel? <laughs> um, it's a good question because just like last night or last evening, I really had some experiences that really made this very clear to me once again. And I think you can definitely say it's the opposite or you may call it the antidote <laughs> to uh, your normal life. And <clears throat> yeah, for example, yesterday I was um, 
generally not doing too much during the day because I was very tired from playing football the day before and that always just knocks me out, like playing for two hours or something. And currently I also do like 10,000 steps a day, so that also drains a little bit of energy. So I just wasn't that fit. But then at the end of the day, I kind of got some energy and I went out for another walk, walked into the city. <clears throat> and then I came back and like now I don't just practice uh, the Zazen or the Zen meditation. Now I also practice some other kinds of uh, meditations like for the courses I'm giving. And yeah, I guess also just to explore some other things. And then I was like, okay, now I'm going to do this, what's called stillness meditation or you could call it stillness meditation. I won't go into that too deeply, but I was just, okay, now I need to do this because I'm doing this course and I need to practice it. So I'm getting familiar with it so I can talk about it with other people and blah, blah, blah. And then I was doing the meditation, but even though like it went quite well and I felt stillness, I was still like in a hurry and it was still like, okay, I need to get this done. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was still very much like goal orientated and with a clear purpose and yada, yada, you know, like, oh, I need to do this so I can get this or I have this. Um, and then I was yeah, done with the meditation uh, and I was also journaling about it and I just felt like not quite at peace with myself and I still felt a little bit weird and hung up like still like someone was dragging me or still like I couldn't really relax and then I thought okay now I'm going to practice more and then I did <laughs> uh, then I did half an hour of my Zen practice uh, which was more than the 15 minutes of the stillness meditation I did. But it was also just, yeah, without any purpose. I wasn't trying to be still or focus on stillness or I didn't do it for a course or for something, whatever. Like I just did it for myself and I just did it because it felt like the most natural thing to do. And yeah, during that, 30 minutes like I was so much more able to just calm down and relax and uh, yeah just let myself go just let my thoughts do whatever they wanted but I was no longer so confined or so yeah pulled by the need for something or anything like it was just enough in itself that I was just sitting there and yeah, that feels extremely, uh, yeah, good. <laughs> or like it was like really huge relief yesterday. I just felt like I could just breathe and just uh, just be myself and be okay. Like, yeah. And otherwise you're always in this mode of being stressed, of doing this and this and this, like your to-do list and blah, blah, blah. So... Yeah, it's just very beneficial for me and very important for me to have this time where I don't have anything that stresses me out or where I can allow myself to be free from all the stresses. So, yeah, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, um, no, that was a really good answer. Uh, I'm just having this thought right now. Okay, if you said um before the first time when you sat down it the meditation was not so um peaceful as it was afterwards um but when you were just like following like your feelings or however you want to call it and just sat down without any intentions it yeah was completely different i'm just wondering um what do you think for the people that are listening could you say makes the difference between those two? Like how can you go from, okay, sitting down and just going crazy in your mind to like the exact opposite? It may not be that easy, 
but also like we can't fool ourselves like even if i practice the zen style of meditation uh you know like you still need to have some kind of intention about it because i mean yeah otherwise you may sit down for a minute and then you just have a thought or feeling and then you will go after that so there needs to be some kind of composure and uh, willingness and discipline uh, but in zen there's also this concept of liberating discipline so i think you do need that if you want this freedom and relaxation like to take care of yourself to give yourself those 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. Um, and I think then it will just happen naturally. Like you can't force it to happen that you get out of this uh, task mode or achieve mode uh, lifestyle or mentality. But if you just practice meditation again and again and then like in my case you will see oh maybe the, those five minutes they weren't enough like it was not enough for me to calm down and that will be always a little bit different uh, depending on how stressed you are currently how your day went uh, blah, blah. like there are a lot of factors and yeah if you just do it again and again if, if you give your tell, uh, yourself a lot of time and yeah, I think then eventually, like, it will just happen. Uh, then you will just open up and come to peace, like, naturally. Uh, but you need to give yourself that time. And that's also, like, the biggest problem I think people encounter with meditation or spiritual practices in general, that they tell themselves, oh, I'm not able to do that. Oh, I can't just sit for a few minutes. Like, my mind is always racing, but yeah that's normal like <laughs> that's the whole point uh, why you're even doing it in the first place because yeah our minds are very strong and we are most often not in control of them or not able to live with them so yeah just have that discipline give yourself the time and then without judging yourself too much or stressing yourself too much about getting relaxed, which can also happen, yeah, then I think you will be fine. And then you will have those moments where you can just breathe and let go and yeah, be at peace. Okay. So on the one hand, like putting in, like putting in the effort, being disciplined, sitting down and practicing, but then also that after a while it becomes more natural that you just feel naturally okay i can just relax and maybe sometimes it just comes by itself or you see like that you're just like pretty um quiet um and that your mind is not very uh, disturbed so that it has like different i don't know how to say like qualities but it's not like always about okay it's just discipline or it's just like like relaxing or doing nothing but it's a little bit of everything yeah in a way and it's also just very paradoxical in a way because you you know you need the effort to get to that place but then you need to let that effort behind you so <laughs> it's a little bit weird uh, and i think then sometimes people also get like misunderstanding of spirituality or certain things because they're like oh everything's perfect the way it is and everything's already great and everything's wrong and blah blah, blah. and then basically it's just an easy way out or they just escape the actual yeah integration of those things into your life which is the discipline um yeah you've uh talked about um uh, one last thing <laughs> uh i just wanted to add that and then we can go into the next topic uh i think very good picture or way of describing what we just talked about with the you need effort but then you need to let go of the effort it's like uh 
there's a thunderstorm and then you walk onto a hill and you have maybe yeah a metal stick or something and you just put it into the air and then you just try to get hit by lightning and you know if you try to get hit by lightning which in the case of meditation is just the peace and the calmness uh, <laughs> um, yeah if you want to get hit by lightning you still need to go on the mountain you still need to put your hand up in the air but then it's no longer up to you like you just do that you put yourself basically in the best case for you to be calm but then you yeah don't have it in your power anymore <laughs> okay okay yeah that's a good description uh, before i actually wanted to continue i was i had the feeling okay i'm not sure if you still want to add something <laughs> but when i was like <clears throat> okay just um continue but nice um Yeah, to connect this to um, your actual practice, um, you said that you're mostly doing Zazen, so just the sitting meditation, if I can call it that way. Um, how did you get, actually get into it, into Zazen and Zen Buddhism? Um, <laughs> it's a very big, oh, that's a very big question. And I guess I could like, describe my whole life because everything in my life before i don't know being 18 or 19 like led up to that point and to me finding out about zen buddhism but essentially how did i end up there essentially i started out with uh, philosophy uh, when i finished high school basically which was like five years ago something like that And I started to read philosophy because I was, uh, yeah, very curious if there's something like a meaning of life or I just wanted to know, like, what's the deal with being alive and being human and just existence in general? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> It's all just weird. Like, there are these people in school and your parents and they all just want something from you and they all have these expectations for you, but... I was like curious, like, why, like, what's the deeper meaning? Like, is it really just about doing your homework every day and going to work every day? Like, is that the meaning of life? Is that just everything there is? Um, and I was just, yeah, I also just wasn't seeing it in other people. Like I wasn't seeing their very deep motivation for why they would do things. And I would also ask like my parents, other people but i never got like really any answers that were uh yeah making sense to me or that they were enough for me like i always was just criticizing everything or just trying to dig deeper which i guess is the essence of philosophy but then when i saw okay nobody has any answers like i was okay christianity doesn't make sense this doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense but then i was also yeah continuing to see what makes sense and then i also needed to confess to myself okay i also don't know what makes sense so i was okay maybe nobody knows what makes sense <laughs> um but then i also started to ask myself okay why Do I have the strong desire for something to make sense? And why do I always try to understand something? And why do I always try to grasp something? And then during that time, I also uh, did a lot of, let's say, experiments with psychedelics, especially LSD and also some mushrooms. And then they just kind of yeah they they opened up my mind like i had a very small uh, tiny view or world view or very limited view of the world and then through psychedelics i was just able to see just the beauty of existence and just I don't know, I got access to a place where I could just be joyful about being alive and be content with just being here. 
yeah, having this experience and that kind of changed everything. And then after the trips, I yeah was no longer able to access these states of consciousness. <laughs> and yeah, I was still stuck in my yeah own habits and my yeah tiny self or maybe huge ego, <laughs> which is always very inflated. Not in the sense that I was arrogant or something, but in the sense that it was just clouding my whole judgment and perception of the world. So then I... Uh, one question yeah, before yeah. you move on <laughs> from this point. Um, that was actually like really interesting, the way you talked about it. But you said before you started with philosophy... And you had <clears throat> all those questions, but you didn't really get an answer. But do you have a feeling that you got some kind of answer through psychedelics? Yeah, yeah, you could say so in a way. But yeah, the answer wasn't like, okay, it's 42, you know, or it's uh, <laughs> uh, this and that. Uh, The answer was more like just life itself. Like, yeah, I think Alan Watts used this analogy of dancing. Like if you dance, you're just dancing and you're having fun and you're just feeling it and you're just flowing with it. And if you dance, you're not constantly thinking about, okay, why am I dancing right now? And should I dance right now? So I guess the answer was just uh, to... Yeah, my, my Zen teacher always says life is about the journey from your head to your heart. And I guess that was kind of what psychedelics were showing me that I don't constantly need to use my mind and figure everything out and dissect everything constantly. I can just enjoy life and be life and experience life. And then that's enough in itself. And also the answer... I mean, I kind of got is that, yeah, reason is, is it's reason, you know, it's always there to, like I said, dissect any, everything and maybe that's not the best way to live your life or that's a very helpful way to live your life. And it's great. Like reason is wonderful and fascinating thing, but maybe that shouldn't be your dominant mode of walking through existence so yeah that was kind of an answer i got <laughs> mm -hmm. were you surprised that this answer was or did not appear in form of a thought did you expect this before mm, probably not because if you're always thinking and trying to find a logical answer like you're not yeah you're not very open to anything else or before I was always like okay if it doesn't make sense it's bullshit <laughs> so I was like okay intuition and blah blah, blah it doesn't make sense and I all, all also was like okay if you're just happy without any reason that also doesn't make sense <laughs> um, yeah no I didn't really see that coming so again, some kind of paradoxical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way. At least from the standpoint of the mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, and from there? Um, what was the last part uh, that I... Yeah, yeah. From psychedelics to Zen Buddhism yeah. somehow. Um, all right, because... I had those trips and I had those experiences and I had access to those states of mind. Then I no longer had the access. And then it also kind of became apparent during the trips because then I tripped like a few more times. But then always during the trips, I was feeling kind of bad or there was like something inside of me that was criticizing myself. Uh, because the psychedelics basically kept telling me, okay, you need to live a sustainable life or 
you can't use us basically to always get access to this wisdom. You need to put in the work yourself. And I wasn't putting in the work. I was just taking psychedelics here and there. Uh, whenever I felt like, oh, I'm not happy or not when I'm not happy, but whenever I felt a strong desire for something more in my life, for something deeper. And yeah, then because I experienced certain things in psychedelics, I just kind of remembered, oh, I heard that in Hinduism or especially, oh, this uh, yin and yang concept that's somewhere in the Eastern traditions. And that's something I very strongly just felt or saw during those trips. And there were a few different things where I was like, oh, I heard this before. And then I started to become more curious about Buddhism, about Hinduism. And then I just realized, okay, I need to have some kind of practice that allows me to reach certain states of consciousness or to have realizations, but in a natural, normal, sustainable way. And yeah, then I found Zen Buddhism because Zen Buddhism was just so direct and so, yeah, not fancy. <laughs> like it, it was just what I needed. It was like the antidote, but just directly in my face, like not through, oh, this is existence and blah, blah, blah. And there's a God and blah, blah, blah. It was just, okay, set yourself down on your ass, see reality for what it is, and then you will understand. But just do that. And Zen Buddhism itself is just a little bit, uh, yeah. It's not really against scriptures, but it always says it's not about the scriptures. It's not about certain ideas. It's not about certain texts. The most important things is that you yourself see everything for yourself so i was just drawn to that because whenever i yeah read something in zen buddhism it was like stop reading sit yourself down and practice <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so yeah there was not so many chances to get lost in texts or anything even though i certainly read a lot and more than i needed but it's just normal if you, I guess, come on this path. Okay. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I could even talk like way more, but yeah, in a nutshell, <laughs> in a big nutshell. <laughs> um, I can imagine that many people that are someone like are somehow on the spiritual path come from a similar standpoint they kind of have some some kind of experiences um but then want to figure out how it's like you know like want to make sense of it what is this how can i get back to this and i think also many people start reading as you did um i'm just wondering how you got from this point of, okay, I'm just reading through everything by myself and start practicing to like also finding a teacher. Um, well, <laughs> uh, I guess just to explain a little bit more about how this, how this thing usually goes, it just like you start reading a lot, like from Buddha or from Jesus or from any other spiritual teacher. And then you're like, oh, wow, that's it. Oh, my God, they found the answer or yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you just read about it all the time because then you just feel close to it and you feel like, oh, now you got it. So for a small moment, you're yes i made it <laughs> but then you realize uh, you're still unable to deal with your feelings or to cope with life in general and you're still not truly happy or anything and yeah then you realize okay it's time to practice because also i guess all the great spiritual beings or teachers they all point to you and that you need to do or make the effort And then when I started to make my own effort, when I started to practice meditation by myself, of course, like 
I wasn't completely sure about any uh, everything when it comes to meditation. Uh, and yeah, then I just naturally try to understand more about it. And then one day I actually was on uh, Twitter <laughs> and I was just searching for Zen Buddhism or just reading like some inspirational <laughs> quotes or some stuff like that. Um, yeah. And then I just found this guy and he was just making some posts and I was like, okay, it seems like he really knows what he's doing and seems like he has a lot of experience and oops. Then I texted him like with some questions and he just replied to all of them and was just very genuine and just seemed like he just really wanted to help me out and yeah, support me. And then like, I guess it just never ended. Like we always stayed in contact. Like I always asked him about this and about that. And eventually I also did my first session, which is like a Zen Buddhist term for, I guess, a longer period or duration of just meditation practice where you practice like for a week or two weeks or just a few days, but you basically just practice for eight hours a day. And then when I did that, he also just supported me. Like I was writing him uh, every evening and he just, uh, yeah, I guess guided me through that process. And then I was like, wow, like he just helped me out so much and he's just always there for me. And then I was like, yeah, I just was okay. Can I just be your student? Like officially, <laughs> not that it really changes a whole lot, but yeah it just felt like he was the right person to be like a mentor for me and yeah yeah and now it's still going and just getting stronger and yeah it's pretty cool mm -hmm. for for how long um are you in contact mm, now it's 2022 almost 2023 so i guess three or four years something like that okay that's a lot yeah i guess i found them relatively early like yeah and what would you say if you just um kind of look back to the point um where you um started getting in contact with him how much would you say did you grow personally and spiritually through this contact um <laughs> i mean in the end it's not just the contact with him like it's a lot of things and i mean i still read teachings and things from other teachers but like for example with Sadhguru or Eckhart Tolle or moji <laughs> all the known <laughs> ones uh, yeah i guess <laughs> People listening to this, like, they know at least one of them. <clears throat> I guess it's, yeah, difficult to have, like, personal contact with them and text with them, like, every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I still had the influence from all of them, like, to a certain degree. Um, but, yeah, I guess a lot of things changed because, I mean, like we talked about earlier or I talked about earlier, you know, now I'm studying psychology. I'm even leading my own classes. Uh, I still have my YouTube channel. We're doing this right now. Yeah, I guess I just um, became a more authentic version of myself, I guess, or... Like a few years ago, four years ago, I mean, I was where I needed to be, <laughs> but I was still very confused. And I mean, also nowadays I'm sometimes confused, <laughs> but uh, I guess I was just able to integrate a lot of stuff into my life and yeah, to to be more true to myself, to really do the things that I really want to do and in the first place I also needed to find and realize what I want to do and you know so four years ago 
I maybe had a rough idea about what I wanted to do, but it was also still very, yeah, it just was like a rough idea or anything. And now I actually have a lot of things in my life that I want to have in my life or that I want to continue to work on. And yeah, I guess the contact, especially with him, just helped me in my own self-realization, in my own development. Um, yeah, and that will always continue. But in the best case, uh, I won't get stuck anywhere too much. Uh, and I will just be able to more and more be who I want to be or be the best version of myself that I can imagine or that I can intuitively, in, intuitively, yeah, whatever, tap into. <laughs> um, yeah. And that always means removing those things from your life that don't serve you that don't serve you like your purpose or your peace, your well-being. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there were a lot of things that didn't serve me that I still did back then that I do either. Uh, not anymore or in a way that's way more healthy and way more beneficial for my life. Good. Mm. I always try to make like some kind of connection between what you've went through and to the audience. And if there are some people listening to us right now and uh, they're thinking, okay, I would like to have like a teacher, like, you know, like, a, like a physical teacher, like not like reading a book by someone. Um, what would you tell them? Is it like, necessary or is it okay if you don't have one um because i think that's like a thing that many people think about at a certain point um i don't think it's necessary uh because i also see like your development and development of your brother or other people i know who maybe don't have a teacher or like a close relationship to a teacher because in the end they all have some kind of teachers or different teachers even if they don't know them personally <laughs> like <laughs> um <Yes. laughs> and i guess there are also teachers in our lives that are not necessarily what you would conceive as spiritual teachers but who are just yeah idols for us or people we look up to sometimes even our parents sometimes not <laughs> but uh, i guess we all know some people who we think oh wow they they really have something going for them and yeah i guess you don't need it but yeah i guess it would just happen naturally or i, I guess if you really feel like oh i need a teacher i think that's good uh, but then i would just be open to Yeah, just see whoever comes along your way. Or, I mean, you can definitely reach out to people like I did, but I never thought that that would happen from that <laughs> uh, message that I sent them back then. Um, yeah, so I would say it's never a bad idea to check out different monasteries or different places, talk to different people, even if they seem to be very far away from you like even if it seems very difficult to reach them in the end it's not that unlikely that they will respond to you if you're genuine um yeah anything i missed or <laughs> yeah i actually think it was a really good answer i was just asking because i think um There are also disciplines or traditions to say you must have a teacher or a guru. And then there are people, for instance, Krishna Moti, that say, no, you don't need anyone, no leader, no institution, nothing. And it's kind of interesting if you like study the lives or like the disciplines, why they say this. And it kind of makes sense. 
but I also think that there is no must or anything. So you just need to figure it out for yourself. Yeah, with, with Krishnamurti, it's always a little bit tricky <laughs> because in the end, he himself was a teacher. I mean, he had audiences and he spoke to them about what they should or shouldn't do. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah. He, he, I think he tried to re, I don't know how to like to put himself out of his position of a teacher as much as he could. But of course, there's always some kind of being a teacher in it. Yeah, but I guess that's what makes a great teacher. If they basically yeah, empower you, you know, they don't make you dependent on them or anything. They just try to do everything that, like I said earlier, you yourself can see everything for yourself and realize everything for yourself. So basically, even though Krishnamurti was a teacher, like people came to him, but then he tried to make them understand that they don't need him, that they don't need to come to him. So <laughs> I guess he was just very direct and yeah, clear and also a little bit radical. <laughs> Good. Now we've talked about, yeah, about yourself what you are doing or what you were doing and how you came from philosophy over psychedelics to Zen Buddhism and then about teachers in general. About any of those um, things that we've talked about, do you want to add anything where you say, okay, this comes to my mind, this could be interesting? Oof. <laughs> Or something that we might have missed? Um, something that we may have missed. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. But I think that it's not that um, unlikely that especially many people in our age somehow enter those or enter these paths in a similar way. Because, I mean, like many substances, it's like there are not so many stereotypical ways of thinking about them anymore, or they are a little bit less. And I think the books are out there. You have, you can get everything on the internet, on YouTube, I don't know. So it's really easy to get into those kind of things very easily. In contrast to, I don't know, like in the past, like you need to go to a monastery or I don't know. So I think that's um, something that is really nice. Good. Um, um, could you maybe um, tell me something a little bit about um, Zen Buddhism itself? Because I think like it's always, you said that it's very simple and very straightforward and that you like those things about it. But I think many people are just out there and still have very, I think like different views on it or don't really know what's the main thing about it. Is there anything that you can say about uh, Zen Buddhism or Buddhism in general? <laughs> um I guess <clears throat> the right answer is that I can't really tell you what Zen Buddhism is about. <laughs> um, because if I try to tell you what it's about, then that won't be the real thing that it's actually about. Um, and it's always a trap like to to say, oh, it's about this or it's about that. Because then you think you know it and then you kind of, you might get complacent with just, oh, I know what it's about. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> um, a friend of mine, like his father, and the friend told me about his father and what I'm going to say. And apparently his father told him that, yeah, I know that there's enlightenment, but that's enough for me. <laughs> I don't need to pursue it. I just know that it's there. And there's like 
uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's honest, I guess, but it's also very weird. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's like, oh, I know there's heaven and there's peace and there's absolute transcendence and unlimited joy and freedom and everything. And then you're like, yeah, I just know it's there. Like, I don't need it. Like, okay, so then you're just going to live in suffering or what's the other plan? <laughs> um, but to come back to Zen Buddhism, uh, in the end, of course, you can still try to describe it. And also in Buddhism, I guess, to some degree, there's this goal of enlightenment or that's, I guess, what it comes down to. That's what you try to reach or that's what you try to embody because it's also always difficult to talk about what enlightenment is exactly, which is also why Zen Buddhism is like, okay, we don't need to define it perfectly or anything. We're just going to get it. Uh, by just being ourselves and then even in zen buddhism there are different approaches to that and yeah to first off maybe try to describe what's enlightenment it's just uh yeah it's getting very tricky now um it's basically no longer thinking about love or trying to become love or anything. It just, yeah, completely being in love and just radiating love. And there are different even concepts of how that happens. There's like, on the one hand, this concept of gradual enlightenment. So you just practice and you practice and you practice and you practice and then you just have the ability to deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper embody the qualities of enlightenment like loving kindness and uh, yeah, wisdom, which just means, okay, you know how to live your life without creating suffering and you live your life in a way that supports the well-being of other beings. But then there's also the idea of sudden enlightenment, which is like something that basically happens out of nowhere. And it's like a, I guess, real experience that can last from a few hours to a few weeks where you're just in a state that's, yeah, I guess, completely alien to your other human experiences. And yeah, it's just indescribable, really. And I mean, I didn't experience it myself, so I can also only go from what other people have told me. And I mean, of course, I had some glimpses into what that might have, what, what that might is through psychedelics, but also through meditation practice. So I guess in the end, it's about that, but it's easier to say that the essence of Zen Buddhism and Buddhism is just to alleviate your own suffering and thus be able to alleviate suffering of other beings, not just even human beings, but all the beings who are here on earth, maybe even earth itself, which can also be considered as a being. But yeah, basically to be kind and to be loving. So yeah that you, you're just a channel or vessel for how the universe is already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but would you say that I can put it that way to combine this, like what you've talked before, the enlightenment part and the relieving suffering, that when we are kind of able to relieve our suffering by not identifying with the mind too much and all those things and if we somehow get better in those things <laughs> um, then it's also more likely that we can experience those kind of states 
uh, if you want to call it enlightenment or what doesn't matter is that correct you mean if you try to be kind then you're more likely to experience enlightenment or if if we are able to um relieve our suffering by i don't know like not identifying with the mind like doing the practices whatever but it's also more likely that we are able to experience those heightened states of um yeah mind consciousness however you want to call it yeah definitely i would say so yeah and that also gives us like a lot of uh, power in the sense that we have the responsibility because if we continue to practice if we continue to work on ourselves then we are actually able to redeem the fruits of our practice or we are actually able to change our lives and the lives of other people um yeah but there are also schools of buddhism where like yeah you can't do anything you you don't have the ability to become enlightenment because it's not up to you if you're enlightened or not and that's true to some degree that's like the sudden thing the sudden enlightenment but then if you just look at your life realistically okay then what are you going to do are you just going to gamble and drink and fuck around and <laughs> just uh, don't give a shit about anything because at some point you maybe get enlightened it's like it doesn't really make sense does it like um and then even if you become enlightened then are you just going to change everything it's like no like there's still your human form and you still need to walk on that human form so that it's not going to block you know the qualities of enlightenment and yeah love and kindness so yeah yeah there's a lot of things you can do as a human and work on yourself so that there yeah there's this possibility for enlightenment or love or kindness and all this stuff <laughs> Okay, I see. Um, I think that's actually a really nice moment to slowly come to an end. I would just like to connect this part to the beginning when you said, okay, you <clears throat> started like you were interested in like figuring more out, you know, starting with philosophy. And now we've talked about like, if you want to call it that end state, like enlightenment and everything. Did you already hear about those things um, when you started going into philosophy or maybe even before? Mm, not really. I mean, no. W what I heard most often before I went into philosophy is just like this Western Christian stuff, like there's God and he's, he has all those qualities that are described as the qualities of enlightenment. Um, yeah, but it was mostly like in this separated outside of yourself way. Um, and basically all those qualities exist, but you need to pray to them and you need to, uh, yeah, be a good Christian or whatever. And then maybe you see if you like tiny bits of those qualities. And that's also something that I, uh, that I think is a little bit sad about Christianity that so many people who are even Christian themselves, they always talk about Jesus being the, the pinnacle, Jesus being the ultimate solution for everything. But it's always about Jesus, 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 and Jesus is the son of God. But then, it's almost always like you can never be like Jesus, but you need to be dependent of Jesus. And I think that's one of those things that Chris, Krishnamurti so heavily criticized or so heavily tried to uh, change in the perception of people that there's not this thing out of yourself that you need. There's not this teacher out of yourself that you need or blah, blah, blah. Like it's in yourself. So... Yeah, that's something that I like growing up here in Germany, like I never really encountered in people saying that, yeah, you can be enlightened or you can be love and peace 
and everything. It was always more in a little bit distorted kind of way or weird kind of way. So, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I picked up some ideas from Buddhism and everything. I think something that I picked up very early and I maybe didn't even identify it as Buddhist. And I mean, in the end, there are also other religions and Hinduism even came before Buddhism. So I guess something of those universal truths I discovered very early on, I don't know where I picked it up, was just this thing of, okay, either you really strive for something and then you get it and you're happy, which also very questionable that you're then going to really be happy because then you're just going to strive for something else. You, you get it, but that doesn't <laughs> mean you're ultimately happy. Yeah. But then the other way is when you just stop striving for things, can't you then just be happy by yourself? And it's not that easy. And it's also not the point of Buddhism. And that's also like a big misconception that people are like, oh, you need to cut off your desires and you need to no longer desire anything, but then you're not going to function as a human anymore. And there are like, some people who really cut off all their desires who live in monasteries in the Himalaya, but then they really just exist in a room and they just sit and then they're in a state beyond anything all the time but they also need a lot of people to take care of them and everything <laughs> because they're no longer working as a human being but that's not really the point and also in zen buddhism or in the most up-to-date version of buddhism because buddhism also developed itself uh, the end goal if there's an end goal it's always um yeah it's always okay you can become enlightened but then still be a human being and integrate that in your normal life so that you can serve everyone and be a bodhisattva so to speak but i'm drifting off a little bit so no i really didn't encounter it in that form earlier <laughs> okay but it was a nice um drifting off <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we, I would say we can still like talk about the, like those kind of topics for a few hours, but before we drift off too much, um, I would kind of come to an end and yeah, just like for the people that are still listening to us, if you are interested in those kind of topics, you can also follow Alex. Um, I'm going to put his link to his YouTube channel in the info box or in the video description so you can check it out. And if you enjoyed the video so far, make sure to leave a like here. Um, and one yeah. thing, uh, you can also then put the link uh, to my podcast in the video description. Yes, I will do there's it. also going to be an episode with the both of us, uh, which is even longer than this one, and which also covers some more topics and some similar topics, but it's, yeah maybe a little bit more about some personal experiences and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. So I will um, put both um, links in the description so you can check it out. So to end this interview, I always uh, like to let my ends, uh, let my guests end this interview because I think it's about them, their spiritual or personal path and their life. So if you have any message for people who, let's say, try to live their way in an intentional or meaningful way, what would that be? Um, the first thing now that comes to my mind is uh, to be vulnerable, like to, yeah, to, to be honest to yourself in a way that you, yeah, that, that you admit your shortcomings, your weaknesses, your failures, your suffering. Because then if you admit that all of that stuff's there and it's there if you're a human being, like I haven't encountered a human being where that's not there. <laughs> um, yeah, if you admit all of that to yourself, then yeah, you allow yourself to grow out of that or to let all of that stuff shape you and that also leads me to another point which is like 
which we also kind of touched a little bit in this episode, but it's that in the end you have all the means and the wisdom and the intelligence and the knowledge about what's best for you. And that's what I mean by be vulnerable and be honest to you, because if you're honest to you and if you're vulnerable with yourself, then, then you will have access to the wisdom and to what you need to do in your life and what's best for you because the wisdom and the knowledge like the self-knowledge or what you really want to become or be like it's already there but yeah we most often don't have the access but we will have the access if we're honest and if we if we are open uh, yeah and then another thing which is also a little bit connected to like having a teacher or anything but it's not always always about teachers um and maybe we're all teachers but it's just yeah maybe ask for help or like just talk to other open-minded individuals and yeah just connect yourself really with people who are on the same path or who have the same struggles who or who are also open and connect yourself with them, build a community, find a community, and that will help you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Um, so being open, reaching out to others and also learning to show your insecurities or like learn to be vulnerable. Yeah. And yeah, trust yourself. <laughs> and trust yourself. Okay. Cool. Then thank you, Alex, for being here. And my name is Till, and this is Till Talk.